Good morning, everyone. Greetings in Jesus. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you once again with prayerful, thankful hearts, asking, Lord God, that by the power of your Spirit, you'll speak to us through your word. More than this, Lord God, as always, asking for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but do us also in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. There are certain fundamental principles we always try to emphasize in studying the Word of God. One of which is Novum Testamentum and Vetere Latet. If you like Latin, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. We try to look at the intertestamental relationship. The Bible speaks clearly of milk and meat. It speaks of milk and meat. Look with me very briefly, please, to the epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 11, concerning him that is Melchizedek, Melchizedek, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk, not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Messiah, the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith, instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection, etc. Milk and meat. Milk and meat. The Old Testament, foreshadowing the new, is the meat. The book of Revelation, things of the future, the return of Christ, cannot be understood unless we understand the Old Testament. There's milk and there's meat. When you see people who've been saved three years, four years, five years, ten years, twenty years, and sometimes more than that, and all they know is the New Testament. If they know anything about the Old Testament, it's the children's stories from Sunday school or maybe a devotional reading of the Psalms or something like that. These are people who have had a continuous diet of baby food. 70% of the Bible is the Old Testament. An unsaved Jewish person who does not understand how the Old Testament foreshadows and is fulfilled in the New Testament revelation of Jesus as the Messiah they only have a partial understanding of the Old Testament. In fact, they missed the main point. Well, a Christian who only reads the New Testament, only reads the epistles and gospels and so forth, without understanding it in light of the old, is somebody who only has ever been fed baby food. 70% of the Bible is the old, nearly. 30% is the new. Unless you understand how the 30 fulfills the 70, your diet has been baby food. And he tells us what the baby food doctrine is. People who don't know about things like the truths of the resurrection, eternal judgment, about uh, repentance, about laying on of hands, these are basic doctrines. It's milk. There's nothing wrong with milk, but milk is for babies. Now, it's okay to continue to drink milk, he says, or the Holy Spirit says through the writer, milk only. The problem is the milk only. What happens when someone has milk only? They're unable to discern good from evil. Just think of the baby. When a baby is a toddler it begins to crawl around the house, its mother has to take everything that that kid can reach and put it where the kid can't reach it because it will eat everything. Anything that kid can put in his mouth, that baby is going to pick up and going to put in the mouth, and so the mother has got to put anything, that, that kid, a button, a pen, anything that kid can eat, that kid's going to eat. Its senses are not trained to discern good from evil. It doesn't know real food from junk. Well, people who only have baby food teaching, only have basic teaching, they're not going to be able to discern good from evil. Now, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it was, but obviously it was somebody associated with Paul, laments the fact that they need basic teaching again. Well, we've reached the same point. Many Christians don't understand basic doctrine anymore. Many Christians don't understand things. 
If anybody was to read The Purpose Driven Lie by Rick Warren, if you can't see what's wrong with that book, just by what it says in the book, you don't understand basic doctrine. You don't even have milk. <laughs> People need the milk again. But for those who've been saved a while, God expects them to eat meat. When you understand how the New Testament fulfills the Old, and how the Old finds its fulfillment in the New, then you begin to eat meat. And it deals with subjects like typology, the typology literary symbolism of Melchizedek, the deeper things of God. That's meat. That's one principle. Second principle is this. Everything in God's Word is by definition important. There's nothing in the Bible that's not important. However, there are degrees of importance. Jesus spoke of this. He spoke of those who strain a gnat and swallow a camel. He spoke of the weightier matters of the law. There's nothing in the Word of God that's not important. By definition, it's God's Word. It's all important. There's nothing in Scripture that isn't important. But essentially, it's like this. The more the Holy Spirit inspired something to be included in the Scripture, the more important it is. The more times something is in there, the more important it is. There's a reason we have three synoptic Gospels plus John. There's a reason we have synoptic accounts of Kings and Chronicles and the prophets that prophesied during their reigns. These things are important. But the more times a verse or a passage is reiterated, the more important it is. If something is in the Word of God one time, it's important. If something is in the Word of God two times, it's more important. If something is in the Word of God three or more times, it is crucially important. And if it is found in both Testaments, it's more important still. The more times something is in the Bible, the more important it is. That's not to say that there are things that are not important, it's all important. One time it's important, but two times it's more important. Three times, highly important, and if it's in both Testaments, it's even vitally important. With these things in view, turn with me, please, back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. Verse 4, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now, obviously, on the most basic level, this speaks of animal rights. Cruelty to animals was forbidden. I'm not talking about animal rights in the sense of the modern greenies. They're a bunch of lunatics. But I'm speaking about animal rights in the sense of God did not allow cruelty to animals. When you have... The plain meaning of Scripture in Jewish Midrash, the most basic meaning is the... Peshet, the Peshet interpretation, Peshet from the Hebrew word Peshut, simple. However, there's a deeper meaning to a Peshet. That is a Pesher, a Pesher interpretation. Now, there's much more that can be said about this. Sometimes it's one historical event that's figurative of another historical event. There's all kinds of ways this works. But always begin with the peshet. When you see somebody looking for a pesher, as it were, a deeper spiritual meaning, without first getting the straightforward meaning, be careful, that's Gnosticism. That's claiming a subjective mystical insight. It's spiritualizing a text out of context. You cannot ever, ever, ever arrive at the Pesher without getting the Peshet. You first must establish the plain, clear meaning within the literary and historical context, what's known as Sitzimleben, Sitzimleben. You first get the context, get the simple, plain meaning. Then look for the Pesher if there is one. Well, what's the Pesher? The Peshet, obviously, is talking about an ox. Turn with me, please to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The ox is one of three primary quadrupeds used in the Levitical sacrificial system. It was one of the three primary quadrupeds. 
You have the lamb, obviously, the paschal lamb, picture of Jesus. To God, one man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin. Therefore, the lamb had to be without spot or blemish. Again, if you like Latin, Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Nobody has a problem with the fact that the Paschal Lamb is a picture of the Messiah. Then we have the Sa'ere Zazel, the Yom Kippur scapegoat. The high priest would put his hands on the heads of the goats on the Day of Atonement, parade the two goats through the streets of Jerusalem outside the walls of the city. The people would spit on the goats, throw stones at the goats, beat the goats with sticks, curse the goats for their sins, and kick them. Then when they were taken outside, one was released into the wilderness and one was killed. One would die so one could go free. Again, Jesus is the scapegoat. He was executed outside the walls of Jerusalem. It's a picture of the Messiah on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But then we have the ox. The ox is the third primary quadruped that was used, the bull offering, used in the sacrificial system of the Levitical priesthood as prescribed in the Torah by Moshe Rabbeinu, by Moses. What is the ox? Let's look. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord, my defense to those who examine me in this. Understand the background. There are those who have erroneously believed that the apostles acted in the flesh, as it were, by casting lots for Matthias when Judas died. There are those who teach erroneously that they should have waited for Paul to show up. This is complete nonsense. If you read the book of Acts, the, rich, the 12 apostles had to be around from the time of Yohanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist. Paul did not qualify. He was not one of the original 12. Think of Paul as a breveted general, a breveted general, or a general with a field commission. During a time of war, due to conscription and enlistment, the ranks of the military swells, but there's a shortage of generals. So what the Ministry of Defense or the Pentagon does is it takes the most experienced colonels and promotes them in the field. It brevets them. It makes them temporary generals. They have the stars and everything. They have the same functional rank as an ordinary general. And if they do well, even though they revert back to their old rank once the war is over, if they did well, they go to the top of the list for promotion to general. But as long as they're breveted, they have the same authority as another general. They have the same functional rank as another general or field marshal, as long as they're breveted. But they don't have the same status. Yet they have the same authority. Paul said he's the least of the apostles. He was not around from the baptism of John. He was somebody who persecuted the church. He was not one of the original 12. He did not have the same status, but he had the same authority. He saw the Lord, and in fact, today we took the Lord's Supper. When Paul writes of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, he writes, I receive from the Lord that which I delivered unto you that the night in which he was betrayed. Almost mysteriously, he writes about the Last Supper as if he himself were physically present, even though he wasn't. Of course, he communed with the Lord's in Arabia. Those years he disappeared, it would appear, and he obviously was taken up to heaven and he had a rapture experience of some kind described in 2 Corinthians. He had the same authority as the other apostles. He saw Jesus and received his doctrine directly from Jesus. Nonetheless, there were those, because he was not one of the 12, were questioning his authority. But he was telling the Corinthians, you know me, you know better. But then in verse 4 he says this, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, which is simply the Latinization of Kaifa, Peter? Roman Catholics erroneously again believe that Peter is the first pope, but would you please tell that guy who's coming to Sydney next week that the first pope had a wife? Or do not only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? 
Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not it say in the Torah, the law also say these things? For it is written in the Torah of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. That's the second time the verse occurs. Once, now it occurs twice. You shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake now he goes to a pesher, to a deeper meaning. Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much that we should reap material things from you? An ox was a neutered bull. It was an emasculated bull. In other words, it was able to devote all of its orthomuscular strength to building up muscle mass to perform its task of plowing and threshing. It did not mate. It did not mate. All of its hormonal metabolism was dedicated to building up orthomuscular mass to do its work. So Jesus did not mate. He was not married. He was single, so he could totally devote all of himself, all of his strength, to the work of plowing and threshing. And so Paul is the same. Paul relates the fact that he was not salaried for the ministry, that he was a tent maker, to the fact that he had no family to support, he was single. It is much easier not to take a salary if you're in full-time ministry, if you have no one to worry about other than yourself. Well, this is an ox, one who plows and threshes, one who plows and threshes. Hence, we begin to see the pesher. It's a type of Christ from the aspect that he was single, he did not mate, and all of his strength was devoted to his work. Paul comes in this character. Same way, he did not mate, he was totally given over to his ministry. Well, let's understand this. He who marries does well, he who remains single does better. It's not good for man to be alone. Holy matrimony is the natural state God ordained for man. Now we'll look about at this tonight again, but essentially, some people have the grace to be single. Those with the grace to be single have a higher calling than those who marry if you have the grace to be single. You will find three characteristics of somebody who has the grace to be single every time. One, it is inevitably related to the ministry to which God has called them. We have people who work with our ministry in Africa. One is called by the Zulus, the mother of many. Our children are very sick children, mostly HIV or AIDS babies. And you can't be taking care of your own baby when you've got all of these sick little babies vomiting at three in the morning who are battling AIDS-related diseases. Somebody is given the grace to be single so she can be the mother of many, <laughs> okay? Somebody smuggling Bibles into Iran does not need a wife and children waiting for him in Geelong because he might not be coming home to Geelong. When somebody has the grace to be single, it's inevitably related to the ministry to which they're called. Secondly, they have a peace about it. They do not worry about the biological clock ticking away or about being alone when they're old. They don't worry about that stuff. They have a peace about it. Thirdly, if they are a male, it does not affect their masculinity. If they're a female, it does not affect their femininity. You look at these guys who've been ironing their own shirts too long. By the time they get middle-aged, they become like picky old women. <laughs> I like to butter the toast this way, and we need to go and like, we should put the peach jam over here. <laughs> I'm not saying they turn into puffs, I'm simply saying they should have got married 30 years ago, they wouldn't get so dainty in their old age. Well, the same thing happens to a woman who's been chopping the firewood too long. If somebody, she loses her femininity. If somebody has the grace to be single from the Lord, if they're a male, it will not affect their masculinity. If they're a female, it will not affect their femininity. It will not affect their sexuality. It'll just be under control. 
Always look for those same three characteristics. Now, Paul was like that. Paul was like that. An ox. An ox was devoted to plowing and threshing. Plowing was to put the seeds. Greek, kerygma, evangelism. Threshing, the deskin, teaching, preaching and teaching, plowing and threshing, okay. The ox was totally dedicated to it. You shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing, that's the second place the verse occurs. Now turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Satan will raise up people who will gossip and attack preachers. Now, notice it's those who do it well. Those who rule well. Those who rule well do not engage in heavy shepherding, and they lead by example. They do not fleece the sheep. It is not Ezekiel 34 people. Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We don't know who they were, but we know what the word means. Nico, suppression of the laity people. Be careful of heavy shepherding. It is not biblical leadership. Those who rule well, leadership is by example. Jesus said, Peter said. Now notice, those who rule well are worthy of double honor. The term there is honorarium. has to do with money. Especially those especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, as it were, plowing and threshing. Those who work hard. Teaching and preaching the Word of God is hard work. But something has happened in recent years. I'm seeing it more. I watched some clown on TV from England the other, other night from Bradford, England. The whole Joe Austin thing. You see these guys standing up week after week. Now God says, the Word of God says, study to show yourself approved. Study to show yourself approved. That may or may not involve Bible college, seminary, whatever. It may or may not involve that. You don't have to have a formal theological education or academic theology. You don't have to be trained to a scholarly standard to be called to the ministry. It will not always involve academic credentials or seminary, but it will always involve study. <laughs> study to show yourself approved. If somebody does not study, God does not approve of them. You cannot teach what you do not know. God does not approve of them, neither should we. When you see these guys standing up week after week, I'm just gonna share what's in my heart. What do they mean? I don't have anything in my brain. <laughs> Go out and get an honest job, you parasite. It's the Joel Austin thing. It's motivational psychology, anecdotes, stories put into Christian jargon. Week after week, the feel-good thing tickling people's ears, it's a lot of garbage. There's no nutritional value in it. Let them go out and get an honest job. They shouldn't be paid anything. It's those who work hard at preaching and teaching the Word of God. That's the third time the verse occurs. One time it's important, two times more important, three times vitally important, and if it's in both testaments, 
which it is more important still. This is important. The ox. Understanding the ox. With these things in view, turn with me, please, to the ox chapter, Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. Verse 4. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. The word in Hebrew for manger here is abus, abus. It's translated as clean, but it could be better translated as empty, having been cleaned out. The trow where the flock eats has been cleaned out. Where there's no oxen, there's no plowing and there's no threshing. Therefore, there is no grain. Now notice it says oxen, oxen, the pair. Remember Jesus gave the parable of the guy who bought the team of oxen, invited to the wedding and said, I have to prove them that they can work together. Oxen were normally sold in pairs and essentially you'd often get an old one and a young one. The younger one was vivacious and had a lot of energy and strength, but it would burn itself out. The older one learned how to keep the pace and would last longer. The older one benefited from the energy and strength of the younger one. The younger one benefited from the experience of the older one. Oxen, two, two. Jesus sent the apostles out in pairs. The Holy Spirit said, set out for me in Acts 13, Barnabas and Saul. Be careful of autocratic leadership. Be careful of turning Bible teachers into gurus. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 12 Paul laments the fact this I mean each of you is saying I am of Paul I am of Apollos I am of Cephas I am of Christ no has Christ been divided oxen it is true I will tell you who is teaching error and deception I will tell you who is teaching heresy and apostasy I will do that why will I do that because the Apostles did it Look out for Diotrephes, writes John. Look out for Philetus, writes Paul. Look out for Alexander the coppersmith. Look out for Hymenaeus. When people deceived the church, the apostles warned about them. So should we. Oh, it's not gracious to name the names of those who are teaching error. What Bible are you reading? You're obviously not reading any. You'd rather let the sheep devour the wolves. No, you'd let the wolves devour the sheep. At best, when you hear that stuff, at best, you're listening to the babbling of an ignoramus. At best, they're a babbling ignoramus, ignorant of the Word of God. You shouldn't name names and warn people by name. It's not gracious, it's not Christian, it's not love. At best, that is a babbling ignoramus, at best. Were the apostles wrong or the Holy Spirit, was the Holy Spirit wrong for putting their names in the Bible? But let's look. Yes, I will tell you who's teaching error. But I'll tell you who's teaching truth. You go out to that table, you will not just find Jacob Prash. You'll find Roger Oakland. You'll find Dave Hunt. You'll find David Hocking. You'll find Arnold Fruchtenbaum. I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. I am of Apollos. I am of Jacob Prash. I am of Art Katz. I am of Dave Hunt. No, no, no. Who is Jacob Prash? Who is Arnold Fruchtenbaum? Who is Dave? No, no. Do not get a guru other than Jesus himself. Do not let Christ be divided. Oxen. Where there's no oxen, never rely on any one Bible teacher other than the Lord himself. 
The name of our ministry is Moriel. God is my teacher. Jesus said, what is your teacher who is in heaven? If God blesses you through the teaching of a particular Bible teacher through David Pawson or Arnold Fruchtenbaum or yours truly or whoever it is, praise God and pray for them. However, there's only one guru and his name is not Jacob or Arnold or David. His name is Jesus. The rest of us are only oxen and make sure you have more than one ox. Nobody is infallible including that pathetic antichrist who's coming to Sydney next week who will try to tell you that he is. Where well, there's no oxen. The boost is rake. <laughs> the manger's empty. Now, let's look at this further, Proverbs 14. Well, there's no oxen, the major is empty, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Who is the word of God? Who is the Logos, the Mamre, the Devar Adonai? It is Jesus. When Jesus was born, where did his mother put him? In a... He's the word. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. That Greek word for swaddling is the strip of bandage, same word that you'd cover a mummy with. In other words, she knew he would die from the Simeon's prophecy. She would soon find out he was going to die anyway. So she wrapped him in the swaddling, the, like a mummy. Okay. But she puts him in a manger. He's, he's the bread of life. You understand? That's why she, she didn't know why she was doing it, perhaps, but that's why she did it. That's what it means typologically. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired it to be put in the Bible. She put the word into the manger. The bread of life. Now let's look at this again. No oxen. Two. Turn with me again back to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Verses 10 and 11. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear material mixed of wool and linen together. I'll take the second verse first. Wool comes from sheep. Linen is something that grows made from flax, it's man-made. In other words, our salvation has to be totally of the Lord, or covered by the lamb. God hates the mixture. The Hebrews could not make a garment of wool and flax. God hates the mixture. The example we always use, the best one, is the one Jesus gave. If you've ever been to Turkey, to Laodicea, you'll see the remains, the ruins of the Roman uh, aqueduct coming down from the hot springs of Pamukkala down to Laodicea bringing the water down and you've got the hot springs and the cold springs around Laodicea it's well excavated now but where the two waters mix the water is lukewarm what does Jesus do with the lukewarm well we're just going to keep the good and get rid of the bad We'll swallow the meat and spit out the bones. There's some truth in an alpha course. There's some good in Toronto. There's some good in Lakeland. We'll just do a pick and choose. No, it is a homogeneous solution. I know. I'll just swallow the hot water and spit out the cold. I'll just drink the cold water and spit out the hot. It's lukewarm. <laughs> When you have the mixture, anything that's true is only camouflage. Once more, as soon as you hear that kind of argumentation, well, it's a mixture, there's some good in it, we gotta take out the, at best, a babbling ignoramus. At best, the words of a babbling ignoramus. Otherwise, they're a deceiver. By calling them a babbling ignoramus, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. The alternative is they're deceivers. Now look at verse 10. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Who's preaching this week? Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Who's preaching next week? Dave Hunt. Who's preaching the week after that? Kenneth Copeland. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. 
Oh, but the Lord really spoke to me once through a money preacher. Maybe he did. The Lord spoke through Caiaphas. He was the high priest and he prophesied correctly by the Spirit of God. Nonetheless, he was a backslider who conspired to murder his own Messiah. If God can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can speak through a televangelist. What's the difference? One jackass as good as another. But they're still a jackass. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You plow with two oxen, <laughs> a team of oxen. You don't mix a good teacher with a jackass. And here in Australia, much like in the United States and in South Africa and Great Britain, you're no different. You have no shortage of jackasses standing in pulpits. There are some good preachers. But unfortunately, the donkeys appear to be in the majority. Let's look. Proverbs 14. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean in verse 4, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Remember, Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. You can get converts from plowing, but you only get disciples from threshing, teaching the Word of God. Verse 6, a scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none. But knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. These people who are going to Lakeland will be the same people of the same kind of people in the same churches with the same hireling pastors who went to Pensacola and Toronto. Be the same ones. When you try to show them it's not biblical, they'll scoff. They'll give you a lot of empty-minded religious rhetoric. You're suppressing your spirit. You have a religious spirit. Well, this, we don't even know what they're talking about. They have all these cliches which they think are biblical. Oh, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. When you point to the scripture. Oh, the letter killeth, the spirit you had the letter. We had the spirit, we have life. <laughs> they don't even know what that verse means. The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was issuing a polemic against the Sadducees and the Pharisees, against the Sanhedrin. They were interpreting the letter of the law legalistically. He was interpreting the letter in light of the Spirit. The letter of the law said, you shall not commit adultery. So Bill Clinton can say, I didn't commit adultery. The Bill Clinton thing. Jesus interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. You lust after someone's wife or someone's husband. As far as God's concerned, you committed adultery. The letter killeth, the law shows were condemned, that were fallen. The law was given to impute sin. It was to teach about the fallen nature of man through the example of Israel and the Jews. The point of the fact we need a Messiah, a Savior. The letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life, born of the Spirit. And that's the meaning of it. But they're so ignorant, and their leaders are so ignorant, when you say, wait a minute, this stuff is not biblical. Oh, the letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life. They don't even know what they're talking about. They'll scoff, they'll mock. They're looking for a kind of wisdom, but they don't find any. Indeed, they're incapable of it. A scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. If you're here today, you should be judging prayerfully every word you hear from me. Either the Holy Spirit is telling you, this guy is telling you the truth by my spirit, or the Holy Spirit is telling you, get away from this guy, he's a con artist. I'm only one of two things. I'm either a con artist, or by his grace, the Lord somehow has chosen to speak through me. Not that it's anything to do with me, I assure you. Either the Holy Spirit is telling you, walk out that door, or he's telling you to listen to this guy. It's only one of two possibilities. Now, if you hear these things and 
Somebody shows you, well, the ox, well, this guy has the gift of teaching, and this is right, this I can see now, this is an ox, and what it means, and it's, he was single, and he was plowing and threshing as a type of Christ, and Paul was like, well, it's easy to you, isn't it? Once you hear it, it's easy. You have understanding. These other people wouldn't have a clue. You think these people at Hillsong would have a clue about the Word of God? They don't know anything. They're incapable of learning it. Milk would be an improvement. You come here, you're getting meat. They don't even have milk. They're like the Hindus with the cow urine. But let's look. It's quite a thing in India. Milk comes out of a cow, but so does urine. And the Hindus, because they think the cows are sacred, they will actually drink the cow urine. Well, milk would be a big improvement. These guys are like the Hindus with the cow urine. I wish they were drinking milk. Then maybe eventually you could wean them onto meat. Then their senses would be trained to discern good from evil. Then they would know for themselves what's edible and what isn't, but they don't. So what does God say? These scoffers seek wisdom, they don't find any, but knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. Verse 7, leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of knowledge. The term fool here is not talking about the term raka, meaning from rake, empty head. We never demean anybody for a natural lack of intelligence. Jesus warned about that quite profoundly. and, 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 and uh, he gave it a caveat that you're in danger of hell if you do that. Who's going to make fun of a Down syndrome person or something like that? But also the idea of a fool says in his heart there's no God in Proverbs. We're not talking about this. This is a different term. The term here, the best I would translate it from Hebrew is those who pervert their logic to justify that which is certainly not biblical, but neither is it rational those who pervert their logic to justify the indefensible. They try to defend the indefensible by perverting their common sense. Leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of knowledge, you'll not know. Now the term discern as we translate it here and words of knowledge is not in the context primarily referring to the New Testament charismatic gifts of the sermon of spirits or the gift of the word of knowledge. In the context of the proverb, it is not primarily talking about the gift of the word of knowledge or the gift of the sermon of spirits. It may relate to that, it may include that, but that's not primarily what it's talking about in the context. In the context, it's talking about simply understanding the word of God. Okay. Leave the presence of a fool or you'll not be able to discern the words of knowledge. You won't know what God is really saying. As we looked at yesterday in Hosea, come out of her, my people. Second Corinthians, come out from among them. Get away from that wacky church and that hype artist preacher. Get away from that clown, that entertainer that motivational speaker pretending to be a Bible expositor, which he isn't. Leave the presence of that fool. Leave that lunatic asylum with the cross on the roof that they imagine to be a church. It's not an encouragement, it's a command. Get away from those clowns, or you'll turn into one. Look what it says next. Verse 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. The wisdom of the prudent will know where they're going. They know what they believe and why they believe it and what they're going to do with it and why. These other ones, it's the folly of fools is deception. These things people get caught up in as the folly of fools. It is deception. Whenever you see deception, it is in some way being demonically orchestrated. Deception is always being demonically orchestrated when it's perpetrated against God's people. These things you see in Lakeland and this and the purpose driven and the emergent church, the ecumenical movement, these things are demonically orchestrated.
The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deception. Verse 9, fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is goodwill. They make a mockery of sin. Jesus died for sin. When I was first saved in the early 1970s, the only born-again Christians I knew who were divorced and remarried they were either people who were already divorced and remarried before they got saved or they got saved and they had an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife who left them and abandoned them and then they married a Christian. The idea of two saved Christians, of two born-again Christians getting divorced and remarried, I never knew any. I never knew anybody who knew any. And I'm only speaking now since the 1970s. Now the divorce rate in most Western countries among born-again Christians, supposedly, is as high as the secular world. But you have major preachers, major ones, who are multiple divorcees and remarried. The biggest Pentecostal preacher in Wales, the biggest one in South Africa, the ones on television. These guys, some of them have been married more than Paula White. They're all doing it. It means nothing to them. They mock at sin. You remain in a denomination that ordains homosexuals? You're mocking at sin. There's an Anglican evangelical in Christchurch who doesn't like me. He says, Israel is too controversial. We don't want to get involved with that. Israel and prophets are too controversial. Yeah, Israel's controversial, but staying in a denomination that ordains homosexuals and lesbians isn't. What a stinking hypocrite. Fools mock at sin. Verse 10. The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah. If there was anyone who understood this, it was him. Jeremiah chapter 15, please. Verse 16. Thy words were found, and I ate them. Thy words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. He's happy in verse 16. In verse 17, I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, nor did I exult because of thy hand upon me. I sat alone, for thou didst fill me with indignation. When you have the word of God inside of you, as Jeremiah did, he ate the word like Ezekiel and like John 10, when you take the word of God inside of you, two things are going to happen. One, you are going to have a joy. But those who do not have the word of God in them will not be able to understand your joy. When you have the word of God in you, you will have a joy that those who do not have the word of God in them will not be able to relate to. Even in terrible circumstances. Jesus said in the last days, when you see these terrible things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. It doesn't depend on circumstance. It only depends that the word of God is in us. You'll have a joy, but others who don't have the word of God in them will not understand your joy. But in verse 17, you'll be filled with indignation if the word of God is in you. His hand will be upon you, and you'll be alone. Ten churches in a town, one of them is not following the ecumenical agenda. One of them is not purpose-driven. One of them is holding out to the... People meeting in a home because they can't find the church where they live. What, what is that? That's a home church. What? Because God's hand is on them, they remain alone. 
You can't sit in the circle of the merrymakers if the word of God is in you. You can't get on an airplane and go to Toronto. You can't go see Rodney Brown. You can't go to Lakeland, Florida. You can't be in the assemblies of God anymore. If the word of God is in you, you can't be in those places. You will sit alone. You cannot be in the circle of the merrymakers. They will not understand your joy, neither will they understand your indignation. If the word of God is in you, you will have a joy they cannot comprehend, and you will have an indignation they are incapable of comprehending. The reason they can't comprehend it is because the word of God is not in them. You come to a thing like this, and you think you're the only one in the town or the village or whatever, and you meet other people, don't you, who see things your way. Just like Elijah, he thought he was the only one, but he didn't know there were 7,000. The Lord will always have his 7,000 who will not bow the knee to Baal, no matter how bad it gets. There have always been individual Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. No matter how bad it gets, he always had a faithful remnant of Israel. In the darkest of the dark ages, they were true believers, way before the Reformation. There was the Lollards, the Bohemian Brethren, the Waldensians. There was never a time when the Lord did not have a people for his own name. Those who have his word in them, they have a joy. His hand is upon them, and they can't sit in the circle of the merrymakers. They can't delight in carnality and deception. But look what it says next in Proverbs 14. Verse 11, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. First, we have the contrast between the house and the tent. A tent has less financial value, and it's mobile. We get thrown out of here, we'll meet over in the British Legion Hall. We get thrown out of there, we'll rent the room in a school. If we outgrow this house group, we will meet in two houses. I cannot tell you how many people I know in mainstream denominations that have gone apostate. Now, I'm not saying they've all gone apostate. They all have not. But I cannot tell you how many I know and the ones who have. Baptists, Anglicans, all the Assemblies of God, and so forth. You know what is keeping them in these movements, even though they know they're no good? If we leave, we'll lose the building. A denominational trust has the property deeds. That's the Elam movement in England. It's the Church of England. It's held together by property deeds, by, 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 by real estate trusts. The church is not the building where the people meet. It's the people in it. They've redefined the church as a building. They're looking to the material. But it says, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, the tent of the upright will flourish. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, I've seen this over and over and over. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. The biggest ministry in the world at the time, the biggest, a mega church, prime time TV, radio, satellite TV, and if you can believe it, the third biggest theme park in the world, a Christian Disneyland, Heritage USA, Jim and Tammy Baker, the PTL Club, the biggest ministry in the world among people who said they were born again. The biggest. Heresy, hype, financial impropriety, Secret immorality, the house of the wicked was destroyed. One day, one day, finished. One of the true great tragedies is the sorry saga of Jimmy Swaggart. Began right, his doctrine was right. He publicly hung other preachers for a kind of sin he was into himself. Whatever his problems were with lust and so forth, I believe God could have given him victory over that. But you go around publicly stringing up other people for the same thing you're doing yourself. <laughs> you go to his place in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, most of the buildings are leased out for commercial property, and it used to be a mega church with thousands of people. Now there's a curtain hanging there to 
cover all the empty seats at a few hundred people at the most. You know, it was in New York. I lived in Tel Aviv. I lived in Israel, but I flew from Tel Aviv to uh, New York when David Wilkerson first opened Times Square Church, and he told me, he told me right in, <clears throat> right in the street, right on, on, on 43rd Street in Manhattan, he told me, God showed me keep away from Jimmy Swaggart. He's gone off. Three months, David Wilkerson told me that. He was right. Three months later, the whole thing happened. What's left of the airport church in Toronto, Canada, the airport vineyard? The freak show is over. So the freaks went to find another freak show. What's left of it? What happened to Pensacola, Florida? After the financial scandals and the split, I'll tell you what's left the Brownsville Assemblies of God in Pensacola, Florida. The mecca of that lunacy in England and Sunderland. What is left of Ken Gott's place in Sutherland? Well, I'll tell you what's left of it. Last I was there, there was a small group meeting in a hotel called the Roker. Once the freak show is over, the freaks will go find another show. You understand, these were the biggest ministries in the world. Once this thing in Lakeland is over, they'll go somewhere else. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. But the tent of the upright will flourish. The tent of the upright will flourish. Pay attention. We, you, I, all of us, we are much, much better off being part of something that is growing slowly than we are being part of something that is dying quickly. You hear what I said? The house of the wicked will be destroyed. The tent of the upright will flourish. We're better off being part of something that is growing slowly than we are something that is dying quickly. You can't find a decent church Make a house church. Verse 12, there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. It doesn't matter how many doors the Jehovah's Witness knocks on, their belief is the way of death. It doesn't matter how sincere they are. A Muslim suicide bomber wants to be shahadi. It's the only assurance of salvation in Islam is to die in a jihad so he'll murder himself and God knows how many innocent people thinking he's going to get 72 virgins. As soon as he pulls the cord, he's going to realize he's in hell and he's not getting 72 virgins. It doesn't matter how sincere somebody is. The most sincere person I ever saw in my life was in a film from Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. He poured kerosene on his head and lit a match. You couldn't imagine anybody more sincere. There's a way that seems right to man, the end of which is death. But that's unsaved people. What happens when it comes among Christians? It doesn't matter how sincere these people are going to Lakeland, Florida, or believing purpose-driven, or going down the ecumenical road. It doesn't matter. It seems right to man, but it's not biblical. The end of which is going to be death. There's only life in Jesus. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and the end of joy may be grief. As we talked about yesterday, biblically and historically, no revival has ever commenced with people laughing. Every revival has commenced with people weeping. Do not listen to liars and deceivers like the Assemblies of God and like Rodney Howard Brown and John Arnott and Todd Bentley. You will never laugh your way to revival. It will not come. You cannot cover up your real pain and your real hurt by laughing. You can give somebody who is bereaved some nitrous oxide and you can put them in hysterics for five minutes. What's going to happen when the nitrous oxide wears off? They're still going to be bereaved of a loved one. Somebody could be up to their eyeballs and problems with their business, finance, marriage, whatever, career. They go out and get drunk and feel really good. 
They wake up the next day with a hangover. Have their problems gone away? No. This stuff is delusional. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. The end of joy may be grief. When there's a real revival and the abortion mills close down, then I'm going to laugh. Meanwhile, the judgment of God is looming on the Western world. Verse 14, the backslider of heart will have his fill with his own ways. But a good man will be satisfied with his. The backslider of heart will have his fill with his own ways. Remember, that's what Laodicea means. Laodicea, my people's judgments, people's rights. I'm entitled to this. They're filled with their own ways. The purpose-driven agenda is not biblical. Ecumenism is not the unity of the spirit. The unity of the spirit depends on truth, not error. I once had one of these people say at a conference, oh, but the Lord prayed we would be one. Yeah, read the prayer in context. When he prayed we would be one in the high priestly prayer, he first said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, not of error. You cannot have unity of the spirit where there's heresy, apostasy, ecumenism. There are as many backsliders in the church as there's those who have left. In fact, we have backslidden churches. We have backslidden denominations. They're not people who left the church. They're people who left the Lord. How do you identify them? They are filled with their own ways. Their lives and their convictions are not scriptural. Verse 15. The naive believes everything. But the prudent man considers his steps. A wise man is cautious and turns from evil, but a fool is arrogant and callous. These people will believe anything. What does it say in Hebrews? If all you've had is milk, and for them milk would be an improvement, you're not going to have your senses trained to discern good from evil. They don't know the word of God, they will believe anything. How can anybody in their right mind believe a criminally convicted pedophile was sent to prison for molesting a seven-year-old boy who says he became a Christian and then gets covered with ugly tattoos all over his body and holds up publicly his mentors, a homosexual like Paul Cain, and a sexual predator like Bob Jones, they're his mentors, his role models. How can anybody in their right mind go to Lakeland, Florida to have somebody like that? Somebody who's deranged, who's, who's, the man is out of his mind, the man has lost his mind. How can you believe that? The naive believes everything. The simple will swallow anything. But the prudent man considers his steps. Don't believe anything. Jesus warns in the Olivet Discourse, when you see these things happening, be on the alert. Watch for these signs. Rick Warren teaches the diametric opposite in print on his website. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Jesus says, look out for this stuff. He says, keep away with it. Who cares what? Jesus Christ said, when you have Rick Warren, how could anybody believe such a terrible man? A man who openly, openly contradicts the teachings of Jesus Christ. Openly, without mitigation. How can you throw the words of Jesus out the window to believe that guy? The backslider of heart will be filled with his own ways. The naive believes everything. But a wise man is cautious and turns from evil. What happens when there is no grain in the manger? If there's no oxen, there will be no grain in the manger. You will not have biblical evangelism. You will not have biblical discipleship. There will be no kerygma, no didaskin. There will be no plowing. There will be no threshing because there's no oxen, no grain. Turn with me in conclusion, please, to Jeremiah 
23. One of the most important chapters in the Bible for the last days is Jeremiah 23. Verse 28, the prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord. If you come with us to Israel in April, I will take you to the grain belt of Israel above the Sea of Galilee. I'll show you. The indigenous weeds, they look like wheat. At a distance, they look a lot like wheat. They're the same color as wheat. The weeds are the same height as the stalks of wheat, but when you get up close, there is no heads of grain. I go to Japan once in a while, and once I was speaking in Japan, and I was watching the news for the American forces in English before I had to go to a meeting. And they had a news report from communist North Korea about the miracle new food of Kim Jong-il, the deranged, demon-possessed son of Kim Il-sung. This guy's a real nut. And they showed the film footage of the new food. They had a machine about two-thirds the length of this platform. And they had these technicians in lab coats at one end of the machine, and they were stuffing in pumpkin leaves and things like that. The machine was crunching it up and grinding it and liquefying it, and then chemically treating it. And at the other end of the machine, there was long green strips of ribbon coming out that looked like green fettuccine. This was the miracle food. All it was, of course, is leaves. <laughs> or reprocessed leaves, in other words, cellulose. When I was in university, I was taught that the digestive enzyme for catabolizing cellulose is synthesized in appendix, appendices. Humans have a small appendix, therefore we don't have the digestive enzyme to digest cellulose. We can eat it, but we can't digest it. While squirrels and rabbits and things, they've got big ones, they can eat, they can digest it. Humans cannot. By chemically treating the cellulose, they were artificially raising the monosodium glucose levels in the blood. <laughs> to trick the people into thinking they were filled up, that they were eating something. But they were being systematically malnourished on a grand scale. They were being slowly starved to death with the miracle of communism's great new invention, new food. No nutritional value, no nutriment, nothing. It was just chemically processed cellulose that could trick their brain into thinking they ate something. When there's no bread, people will eat the weeds. Jeremiah 23, verse 28. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What the straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord. I had a dream, I had a picture, the Lord gave me a picture. Again, this is not prophecy, it is clairvoyance. That is not how prophecy works. That wicked deceiver, Cindy Jacobs, went to Zimbabwe and gave prophecies. It was going to be the garden spot of Africa. I was just there a few weeks ago. You wouldn't believe what Mugabe's done to that place. Then she goes off to another conference and tells more lies. She's just a lying spirit. The woman has a lying spirit, so does Rick Joyner. These people have lying spirits. Remember, deception is always demonically orchestrated. Mike Bickle, these people are demonically orchestrated in what they do. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream. Now, I'm not saying God does not give dreams, but they'll always be biblically based, scripturally examinable. 
Let he who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain? But grain requires oxen. No oxen, no grain. They're eating weeds. What is purpose driven? Weeds. Weeds. That's all they're eating? Weeds. What was the doctrine of promise keepers? It's weeds. It's weeds. That's all it is. They're eating weeds. They eat the weeds because the manger is empty. The manger is empty because there's no oxen. But much increase, much increase comes from the strength of the ox. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. A false witness speaks lies. A faithful witness will not lie in verse 5. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses actually teach people they can lie to advance Jehovah's kingdom. I have ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who got saved in England tell me that and show me it in their literature. Islam has the doctrine of taqweed. They're allowed to lie because they don't see it as a lie. They see it as military disinformation in the jihad against the infidel. When a Muslim says he believes in peace, he doesn't. He believes in hudna, not salim. A temporary ceasefire until they can get the advantage to give it to you in the back. That's their religion. Tell them I said so. I can prove it in their own literature. Tell Judge Higgins I said so. I'd like to bring him to Saudi Arabia. Let him be a judge there. A faithful witness will not lie. A false witness speaks lies. They lie. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Leave the presence of a fool, or you'll not discern words of knowledge. Get away from that wacko. But much increase comes strength of the ox. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. The tent of the upright will flourish. Much increase comes by the strength of the ox. The naive will believe anything. But a prudent man considers his steps. It's not there once. It's not there twice. It is there three times. And it is in both testaments. The ox. The ox. Not the donkey, not the jackass, not the hype artist, not the televangelist money preacher, not the false prophetess, the ox. Much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Much increase. Western society is in a state of moral and spiritual decline, and there is no easy way out of it. There is no shortcut to revival. There is no substitute for biblical evangelism and preaching and teaching the word of God. There's no substitute for prayer. There's no easy way out. It requires prayer, it requires work, it requires the strength of the ox. There's no easy way out. There's no gimmick, no plan, no alpha course, no purpose driven, nothing. No 40 days, none of that is going to make a difference. None of it will work because none of it's scriptural. There's only one thing that works. There's only one thing that can ever possibly work. We're seeing decline, decline, decline. I don't want to see decline. I want to see increase. I want to see blessing. I want to see authentic moves of God. I want to see genuine church building. I want to see biblical evangelism. I want to see scriptural models of discipleship. I really want to see the Lord glorified in Australia. But there is no shortcut. Where there's no oxen, the manger is clean. 
but much increase comes from the strength of the ox. God bless.